Yeah, so like next year. Good morning to all of you folks that are jumping in early here. Just letting you know that uh, we will, we're just getting geared up. We'll be set to go at uh, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time. Appreciate all of you joining us and hopping on here early. So uh, start talking to you guys here soon.
figured mine was, but good, good morning, try. everyone. Just uh, logging in here. We still have about four minutes. Just wanted to say hello. Again, appreciate all of you that are joining. We're seeing a bunch of people here logging in. Uh, we'll give it a few more minutes while everybody's logging in. Uh, and then we will get going and we'll work to start precisely at 11 a.m. Uh, again, we appreciate you being here. I uh, have a lot of great stuff to talk about today. I'll introduce Bob and my, myself here in just a couple minutes while we uh, allow folks these last uh, few minutes to log in. but you still all right folks we have uh about a minute to go before we we uh get going here uh just wanted to say welcome again to everyone um uh, give everybody uh the last minute or so here to um to finish logging in and and we'll get going Uh, just a couple things why you guys are finishing logging in. Uh, uh, again, uh, my name is Tim O'Connor. Uh, I've been with OECS uh, for uh, quite a few years now, ever since I retired from the United States Army. Uh, love the company, love what I do in this career, love being able to, to help and support and and uh, be in the field with so many different folks in general industry and construction and even the mining industry. Uh, Bob Williams, I'm gonna let Bob introduce himself here briefly. Hello, uh, as you see, spent many years in the grocery industry before moving into construction, big career change. Uh, one that I welcome a lot, I learned a lot and thrown into the role of, of safety coordinator on a site, which piqued the interest of why do safety and why have safety? And it's been a fun ride. It's very interesting, a lot of science behind it. And I'm intrigued with that safety aspect. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And I, I, I don't know if you uh, said specifically to everybody, but you worked for Minnesota OSHA, right? For yes. how, many, how many years? One year. Okay. All right. So Bob has some, some insight and knowledge on some of the things we'll be talking about. And you know, we have we have a number of of our associates that have retired or or uh, previously worked for Minnesota OSHA uh, and and other uh, federal OSHA agencies. So we have a, a great breadth of experience here on our team of thirty some field associates. During the webinar today, you know, we you guys can't talk during the webinar because we try to limit it so we're not jumping on on top of each other. But you can. Uh, 
text in the chat box feature, text in your questions, and we'll take questions. Uh, we'll take as you know a few here and there, time permitting. And but if you do have those questions that you really want answered, at the end here, Bob and I will have all of our contact information up on the screen, so you guys can call us directly. We actually answer the phone, and we're more than happy to answer questions and or email us. And then we'll also have the company's main number uh, on here as well. Uh, we will make this presentation available within about a day or so on our website at oecscomply.com. Uh, and again, all that information will be on the end, so or at the end of the presentation. So here we are. We're we're a lot of you have joined today. Again, uh, we have great appreciation for all of you that that take the time out to get on here and want to learn a little bit pose some questions, bring up some of, of uh, the things that you've seen over the years as well. We get a lot of great input and recommendations many times from a lot of folks that join us. Here's a, I won't read all of these, but a lot of the things that we're gonna discuss today, we'll take some more time on some topics to dive into a little bit. And and uh, on others, we're, we're just gonna get right to the point. But again, if you guys have questions, more than happy to take them as we go. We do have a moderator that can jump on and and ask us some questions. So first and foremost, what can a safety committee do for you? Well, it says there on the screen, active and engaged safety committee is one of the best tools employers have to help reduce employee injuries. A couple key words there in that statement, Bob, active and engaged. And over the years, uh, I think you've seen and I've seen and many of our, our folks, our, our fellow associates have seen that some safety committees are not very active and they're not very engaged. No, pretty stagnant. Pretty stagnant. And, and, if, and if that's the case, we're going to try to get to some tips, uh, how to avoid, avoid some pitfalls, some recommendations that we've collected over the years through, you know, a, a conglomerate of hundreds of years of experience now to impart uh, on you today and hopefully give you some ideas to, to implement in your safety committee. So how do they help? Again, a lot of bullet points, a handful of bullet points on here of how they help, uh, what they're going to do for you. But we're also going to inject some recommendations for you that you may be able to add to your agenda and some of those ideas of how to implement some of the things that have really benefited those safety committees that we've seen work well with companies over the years of getting actual results. Because in the end, the goal is to make sure that this time you're spending on the safety committee, spending this time, this, the time together in meetings has a, an actual solid objective and end state. And that's going back to the first point to tie it in. First and foremost, the safety and health of all workers and employees, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So again, over the years, what we've seen with issues and, and real safety champions, uh, where they're not using the time well, we're going to outline some instances of some tweaks and corrections of where maybe you can take some of what we discussed today uh, to, to take back to your folks. But let's talk about one of the things we want to get out earlier instead of later, okay? The compliance piece. Yes, there's must-haves and shall-haves, right? That are going to be the derivative of compliance. Um, why must we do this? Why shall we do this? Well, one of the reasons is it's outlined by who? OSHA or in our specific state, MinOSHA. Okay, so we do have to have safety committees in the state of Minnesota. And there's 13 other states in addition to Minnesota that have to have certain safety, safety committees if they meet certain criteria. So first and foremost, on the federal level, there is no general OSHA requirement to have a comprehensive written, uh, uh, well-maintained and established safety committee plan or program on the federal level. Does that mean that if I don't have to have a safety committee because my state plan says I don't need to, I shouldn't have a safety committee? No. No. It's a really good idea because like you said in the previous slides, it's a great tool and you want to have one. Yeah, and, and we're going to talk about some of those reasons, even if you don't have to, by the must-have, shell-haves, why you should have, all right? And, and the difference of should have is 
what we're going to drive here today and what we want to make sure we kind of pound on is one of the, the, the core statements we use a lot in safety. We're always working to be proactive versus reactive. Why? Yep. Because if we're reactive, as you guys know, something happens. We want to avoid those somethings that can happen as much as possible. And using the safety committee as a tool for active, engaged participation, communication, information dissemination, and outlining training and things that should be changed is a significant way to do that within your company. Again, whether it's general industry, whether it's construction, it's mining, it's maritime, all sorts of ways the safety committee can benefit you. There is an OSHA white paper, all right, on safety and health programs that talk a bit about safety committees and more specific, those specifically those states that do have requirements uh, when it comes to safety committees. So we'll use our home state here, Minnesota, as one of those examples. And if you look at the state statute 182.676, Safety committee require all employers with more than 25 employees in the state of Minnesota, more than 25 employees to establish a joint labor management safety and health committee for their workplace. And we'll talk more in a minute about that joint labor management. So the trigger number is 25. Let's talk about that for a second. Bob, what if at some point in time, because over the year, I, I may go over 25 employees, but they're seasonal. Um, it's a slower time of year. Maybe I dip below 25. I'm back down to 2022. 20, but for some months of that year, I'm at 30, 35 employees. Does that mean I have to have a safety committee? It Yes, it still does. Because you hit over that number of 25. Bingo. You're still also below 25 at other times. And as you see on the screen, reasons why you should have a committee what the requirements are as to why you should have a committee when you have lower than 25. Are you do you have a dart rate that's in the top 10 percent for example would be one of the reasons. Yeah so the dart rate days away restricted time if my rate is is in that top 10 percent you're still going to have to have one even if you have 15 employees right. Correct. But going back to what Bob just said the earlier point and we get this question a lot is but I'm not always over 25. It doesn't matter. And, and we want you guys to understand that. If you cross that threshold number of 25, even for uh, months out of the year, you must have an established safety committee. All right. Some of the other requirements that Bob was just talking about is a safety committee per the state statute and in the definition must hold regularly scheduled meetings unless otherwise provided in a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, let's start with the regularly scheduled meetings. What is a regularly scheduled meeting? That is a really good question. Periodic, is it quarterly? Is it monthly? Maybe it's biannually. I don't recommend the biannual. I would stick with a quarterly or monthly because that is going to be a more consistent, more opportunistic time frame to have good discussions around safety of your company. What is it for you guys? That's, that's a, the real question. Yeah, that's the big question. Exactly. Great, great way to explain that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more because we do get this question a lot about regularly scheduled meetings. And then it says employee safety committee, committee members must be selected by employees, We're not the employer. Well, <laughs> Certainly the employer has say, the owners, the management, uh, they have say. But I, I want to I say what I've experienced, not to say you, you have experienced this in your company, but there, are, there is a lot of voluntold, right? You're, 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 hey, congratulations, you're on the safety committee, make sure you're at this meeting. I understand it may be hard to get people to want to volunteer to be on the safety committee. But with some of the things we're going to discuss today, hopefully this can help move you in a direction to engage and communicate with your employer, employees where they would like to be more involved in the safety committee. Because we understand um, how difficult it can be to get folks to want to volunteer. 
And then it says, lastly, an employer that fails to establish or administer a safety committee or required by this section may be cited by the commissioner. The Min OSHA state specific program requires you going back to that threshold number of 25 and then the ORs, okay, if you fit into that top 10% of, of, of uh, DART rate, that you must have an established safety committee. You must maintain regularly scheduled meetings. Uh, you must record the meetings and have a copy available for inspection of those meetings, digitally and or hard copy. You take notes on and have a written agenda. But let me share with you real quick, three specific incidences this year in 2022, and we still have a few months to go, two and a half months to go, where three employers have had uh, just programmed inspections, random inspections, whatever you'd like to call them. They knew they had to have a safety committee. They weren't keeping up on regularly scheduled meetings. They weren't keeping up on notes and documentation of those meetings. And they were all three individually cited. And it is cited, folks, as a serious violation under Section 182.666 in the state statute. Serious violation can be up to how much in penalties? It can be in the thousands. Yeah, up to $7,000. $7,000. Now, I've never seen any company maxed out on that penalty, but let me tell you uh, just one more addition to, to the story with all three incidences. Uh, many companies, if they are cited or they have violations, which sometimes do end up becoming violations with citations are offered the ESA, which is an expedited inform informal settlement agreement to where you're going to knock 30% off that penalty uh, unless you can test them, unless you can get them removed. But all three not having the safety committee were not even offered the ESA. So the penalties stood in total number and each one of those totaled over $1,000 over $1,000 for not maintaining your safety committee. That's the small part, folks. Okay, $1,000 may not be a big deal breaker to you, but if you're not doing what we're talking about today, where not only it's a must have, shall have, you're missing an opportunity to really stay and remain proactive in the serious nature of safety and health to all of your workers and employees. So let's talk about this framework a little bit now that we're, we're moved on past compliance. And yeah. let's get in. Excuse yes, me, Tim, we have a question. Do you have yeah. a moment? Okay. We have multiple companies that operate individually, but are all owned by the same individuals. Yeah. Since the companies are all separate, do I look at them individually for the 25 employee real, rule with the safety committee? If the committee is needed, then do we just do one committee for all companies? Yeah, that's a great question. And maybe somebody um, uh, read forward in our slides today, uh, Justine. So if I can just ask that person that asked the question to put a pin in that just for a minute, we are going to get specifically into that question in a little bit when it comes to multiple facilities, multiple locations, but excellent question. So instead of me answering right now, hang on just for a little bit, and we will get into specifics on that question. Thank you. So again, on that framework, folks, laying the groundwork, laying the road work uh, or the road map to how to be successful is what do we need to do? What are the requirements? Okay, if we have state statutes that define the requirements, well, that's a good start point. Okay. And then the question that was just answered, determine if multiple locations are required. They could be. But are they necessity or necessarily needed to have multiple safety committees for one company? The answer oftentimes is no. But we're gonna, we're gonna give you some ideas and input of how to include all those different facilities and locations into the company and or corporation's main safety committee. So again, we'll discuss that more in a little bit about the requirement and that specific question. Develop or modify the existing safety and health policy on specifics related to the committee. And then I put some bullet points here. What are the reasons your company is establishing the safety committee? Again, folks, we may have the known quantity, which is, well, they're telling me it's required. I have to have one. I have 25, more than 25 employees, and I my company is based in Minnesota. Okay, pretty easy, but we got to go past that just 
specific compliance requirement. Okay, need for employee cooperation and support on all different levels, including management, supervisors, and workers or employees. Brief general statement regarding roles, and we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. All right. So have a policy statement for your safety committee, your company safety committee. Um, we write a general policy statement uh, and safety committee policy slash program for, for many clients. We've done that for years. But what we specifically make sure we do is we, we can't just have a cookie cutter template on that policy, right, Bob? Correct. And, and why can't it just be a cookie cutter template? Because not everybody meets that cookie cutter. Yeah, bingo, right? It's not, every company is not the same. So we may have same similar language in, in, in you know, a handful of pieces in that policy, but then we have to specify the inclusion of what does it mean for you and for your company, for your organization? Getting into a specific mission statement and that mission statement's purpose and defining that. And then roles and responsibilities, extent of authority. So here's a, a part of a sample of what that policy statement could look like, all right? An introduction of what it is for the company, while, why you're doing it, why you're having a safety committee, the mission, the scope of the mission, and the organizational purpose and scope of the roles, responsibilities, and the all-encompassing uh, uh, process of that committee. What we mean here is all of these pieces that we write in black and white, if you're not doing the other things to involve uh, joint labor management to get real engaged feedback, and then to communicate, disseminate that back down to all employees, we see where folks are kind of checking boxes with the safety committee, all right? And, and that's one of the main goals today is we want folks to avoid checking the box, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and so, you know, if we're just checking boxes, holding scheduled safety committee meetings, making some notes, great. But if we're not imparting what's coming out of those safety committees to each and every individual within groups, within a team on certain job sites and construction, whatever it may be, you're missing the end state uh, goal of the composition of the safety committee. Also have a charter and bylaws. We write these for our clients too. And this is an example. I won't read through all of these as far as the purpose and activities, but if you look at that function column, it gives you a, uh, an, an overview of, of what the composition should be in the different parts of all things safety committee, uh, training, meetings, employee involvement, incident accident investigation, near misses, which we'll talk about here a little yep. bit more and, and some ideas of how to apply that into a safety committee, and then all the way down to every place where you have employees working, whether it's in the field or in certain specific shops uh, or a general industry facility, and then a evaluation of the organization safety and health program because it shouldn't remain stagnant, right? Correct. With you all want it fluid. Yeah, with the, the, the key word fluid. I love that. With all things safety, we have to have uh, we have to have some fluidity there because things are always changing. Um, processes, job hazards, introducing new hazards. What's the what's something that always changes within the company's makeup? Well, people. Right, we have folks that retire. We have people that come and, and go. We have new people coming in. So there's all kinds of change going on all the time. So let's talk about that membership and some of the specifics of the safety committee membership uh, in and of itself. So upper management determines committee size, and we're gonna we're gonna talk to you guys a little bit about committee size here. All right, um, but one thing in the Minnesota statute specifically is half must be management, upper management, ownership, whatever, half must be employees, labor. So what is the number of my safety committee? Any recommendations there, Bob? You could go, golly, it, what size is your company? Say I have, say I have, uh, I have 75 employees. 75 employees, yeah, uh, you probably, I don't know, more than five. 
maybe less than 10, you start getting too many people. And now the old adage, there's too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a hard number. You have to figure that out uh, kind of on your own, but the ballpark, 75 employees, five to 10, somewhere in there. Odd numbers are always better than even numbers. Great point. Because then we get even numbers and we got a 50s, we got a split vote. How do we resolve that? Right. Uh, but odd numbers are better. Five to 10 for 75 employees, 100 employees. You have to figure out that exact number that works for you. There's some ballparks. You have less employees, less committee members. Maybe you have multiple locations. Another idea for the same number is one representative from each of those areas or divisions to bring to that committee. Another idea. What is, fits for you? Yeah, great, great uh, definition there and explanation. So our, one of our guidelines, in, in, and we'll talk about Minnesota specific pertaining to their definition in the statute is based on that number. If you can make sure you're trying to always achieve 51% labor or employees to 49% management, you're, you're, you're meeting the requirement as its definition is stated. And then you're also giving uh, room for enough employees to be on the safety committee. And that goes into our next bullet point is, and it ties back into what we said earlier in the compliance statement, employees elect their employee representatives or solicit volunteers. Many times, folks, we see that volunteers end up being voluntold or they're volunteered. Well, you're, you're a great spokesperson. You do it. And some people are, they're more than willing, able, and they're happy to grab that. They get a lot of uh, pride in saying, gosh, I'm glad you guys you know, want me to be on the committee, want me to be the spokesperson. But it's not always that easy. But we want to avoid one of the pitfalls of having employers management assigning and telling everybody who's to be on that committee. You want that voice to come from the employees of who their representative should be or representatives, okay? Uh, all major work activities are represented. What does that mean? Let's go back into the question earlier. So there's multiple, multiple part answers into that question. And, and I assure you, we'll continue to define it. What if I have, uh, home base, my main company is here in Minnesota and throughout uh, outstate Minnesota, I have another three or four facilities. I have 10 folks at one facility that's mainly warehousing and distribution. I have you know, 30 folks at another facility that does some production or in construction, I have job sites where on some of those sites, say they're bigger sites and, and they may have 50, uh, workers out there on the job site and the job is going to last a year. Uh, we have to make sure we're representing all of those places and all of the activities that are done, the scope of work that are done in those places. So going back to that earlier question, do I need to have multiple safety committees? The answer is no, but it may be good to have them if you're kind of disassociated as far as not being around the flagpole all the time, meaning could it be beneficial to have our own areas or facility or job sites, mini safety committee, and everything is fed upstream to the main safety committee. So those voices are heard and things are done and assigned and everything as well. Okay. And then lastly, it says maintain a reasonable rotation among committee members. It may not be a benefit to have the same committee members on for six years, right? No. No. Why not? I, like everything else, they get stagnant. Maybe they don't hear everything that's going on. So getting fresh faces in there, involved, it helps the committee. It helps the employees know that, other, that everybody's looking at it. Good rotation. Good rotation, fresh ideas, fresh faces, reinvigoration. Um, you know, it is good to change it up. And when you make those changes, wherever, whatever your safety committee is comprised of, 
Try not to do one fell swoop of changes, right? Yeah, you don't want to do that because then all of a sudden we're all we're having to start over again. And that takes time. We rotate people in and out every six months, or you know, maybe you're running with a two-year term. And so then one person's on for these two years, and in the middle, somebody else we make the change. Bingo. Because now you have experienced folks on the committee that can also mentor the new folks. Correct. Right? So we're not starting from scratch. Correct. Yeah, great. Uh, appoint notify management representatives. Well, management representatives. Boy, that sounds fancy. The bottom line is, you know, if we follow some of Robert's rules, which a lot of this we can utilize as that platform for an agenda and how we hold regular uh, safety committee meetings is appoint some folks that have specific responsibilities. A chairperson. The person that starts, guides, and drives the meeting, so we're not uh, so, getting off the rails, right? So when you say management representatives, you're talking about management of the safety committee. Safety committee, great point. Not of the company. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you you brought that up. So, can the chairperson be an employee that works on the production floor? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And and a lot of times that's beneficial. Very beneficial. Yeah. I've seen that that works typically a lot better than company management sitting in those roles because it, it, it shows leadership from that individual and from the employee side of it, yeah. which is very beneficial. Great point. I'm glad you mentioned that. A vice chair, secretary, somebody that's keeping the meeting notes, you know, again, maybe it's your HR person that is on the safety committee, which happens a lot with HR folks, right? Because yeah they're they're uh you know good centered on, on a great note takers <laughs> great great for information dissemination communication yep um not to say that that has to be your secretary but in a position somewhere where they they have a voice as well to help guide notify volunteers or elected employee representatives of acceptance as committee members uh notify those folks and then notify everybody else it's good for everybody else to know who's on the safety committee right Absolutely, because then as an employee in the field, I can go say, hey, Tim, can you bring this point up at the safety committee? Yeah, right. And and I've experienced, in, in, you know, in some places where we'll talk about the safety committee and this and that. And I, I've, had, I've had folks in groups and trainings and I, who's on our safety committee? Well, and another point is compliance comes out, right? Ocean mm -hmm. inspector stops by and he asks, he asks me, do you guys have a safety committee? Well, I think so. You know what? We do. Tim happens to be on it. Problem solved. Yeah, I thought we were done with compliance, but it still ties back in compliance there. Compliance the is always there. Gosh, all right. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll continue to make sure we're, we're covering the compliance side. So safety committee chair, again, folks, I won't read all these bullet points, but just some general uh, uh, suggestions as far as definitions of each role, right? You want to define this in your charter, in those bylaws or in that safety committee policy. Uh, what are the roles uh, of the chair, uh, of the vice chair, of the secretary? Because if you don't assign the roles and responsibilities, who's doing what? We have a round table now of a group of five, seven, nine, 11 of us on a safety committee. We want to come in there with some uh, direction and again, that, that roadmap to success, right? Yep. So it's very important to assign some of these folks. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, as you see there, the bottom bullet under secretary, posting the minutes for other employees. Mm. That isn't just the people that are on the committee. Mm. That's sharing it with everybody because, right, there might be something that you talk about that raises a question for them to bring to you next meeting. Yeah, and... and uh, I like that. I like that you said that we'll talk about it a little bit more on the communication piece here coming up, but that is vitally important. All of those folks need to know that holy buckets, the safety committee is really doing stuff, right? It's not just another committee or another meeting we see on the calendar or Correct. somebody's told these people to go to. Correct. There's there's actual work being done and then they see what's coming out of it. That's the benefit. I mean, that's where that that's where this really starts to gain steam. And then you can even get those folks years later, boy, I want to be involved in that safety committee. I have some things to say. I have some ideas. And then all committee members. Again, um, just some recommendations on these bullet points here, representing their departments, listening to folks and suggestions, 
being able to have, you know, some type of, of form or something to fill out that, uh, you know, department leads or heads can give to folks from their department or somebody on the safety committee to bring to those committee meetings. Reporting of unsafe conditions, contributing ideas and suggestions for improvement. Where do some of the best ideas and suggestions come from? People out in the field, people out on the production line. Bingo, bingo. I mean, they those are the folks that are doing jobs. They, you know, 40 hours a week, sometimes more. They are the subject matter experts. They are. They are the ones that can say, gosh, this, I think we could do something better here ergonomically. I think this process could be better. I, I observed some things where safety, you know, uh, uh, could be improved. Those are the folks to get those ideas up to the discussion and up to the table of the safety committee to work on getting real results, right? Correct. Promote safety and health programs for all employees. That should be discussed during your safety committee because, again, there's change that needs to happen there. Assist with safety audits, accident investigations. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So the composition of the safety committee meetings. What are we doing in these meetings? Some of it we've already outlined, but again, some more topics to discuss. We come back to this regular or periodic basis, how many folks are on the committee. So again, some recommendations. As Bob said earlier, folks, if you have a safety committee and say you have 35, 40 employees and you have five members on your safety committee, just to throw out some numbers, two meetings a year is not gonna cut it, nope, right? Not gonna cut it. Why? You're just not meeting regular enough. People aren't feeling that we're making good progress and good improvement. And we need to quarterly because you're more consistent yeah. on Con a quarterly basis. Consistency, and then, regularity, and, and because get, what else happens between those times? All other things come up, right? Or a lot of other things can come up. Injuries, things to discuss. Again, going back to if we're more proactive, we don't have to be reactive not just to the compliance side. I'll say compliance is secondary to that. More on the side of keeping folks safe and healthy. Correct. Okay. Uh, determining date, time, and location of meetings and notifying everyone. I've been involved in safety committees. I've been chair of safety committees. And you show up and you're sitting there and you say, I thought the safety committee was here in our conference room today. And it's just you <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> just important little things that can be brushed over, but they're you know, you want to make sure everybody is gathering in the right place, right time. Everybody's time is, is very important. Uh, use an agenda format. We'll show you an example of that. And agendas should be distributed to members a few days before meetings. Here's a big one. This has happened to me way too many times. I show up and I have my, I'm, I'm just a, I'm a non-member. I can be a non-member. Many times we are. We're there as to consult, to be a, uh, a person to go to for questions during the, the committee meeting. But nobody has meeting notes. Some one person says, well, hold on, let me go run and make a copy of this one from two months ago or what. Be prepared, come to the meeting prepared, have copies for everybody, make sure all committee members are looking at the agenda to look at old business. Has anyone added new business? So they can come and take a look at what's been uh, outlined in the agenda, hopefully with ideas prior to just waiting until their turn or until something pops into their head. All right. So here is an overview, again, an example, very simplistic format. You can make these as intricate as you want. You can keep them very simple. But again, following some of Robert's rules, simple principles of a meeting agenda, uh, have a welcome and introductions by the chairperson. So now I have my my front person, the chairperson, saying the meeting is now called to order at such date and such time. Again, on time, on task, review of minutes of the previous meeting, record the attendance. That's important to make sure we're getting the people there that should be there and that are assigned to the committee. It's also important when it comes back to that compliance thing you brought up a couple of times, Bob, yep. because we'll OSHA look at some of that and say, well, I see you have a meeting, but uh, who was here? Who's here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Review the old business and issues. We're going to talk a little bit more about old business, new business. And it's really important to get some of this stuff on there, folks, and to outline what it is for to do's, who's following through, who's the point person to make sure we're collecting information, 
following up on ordering something, scheduling a training because we pointed out that there's an area of concern where we need to do some additional training, set date and time for next meeting agenda. It's great to try and plan them out for the year. We understand that many curveballs are thrown throughout the year, so you may have to adjust fire a bit, but then make sure you're setting it um, during that meeting, if not prior to, and if changes have to be made, communicate that so everybody knows. And then adjourn meeting. How long does a safety committee meeting need to last, Bob? I've seen them last as short as 20 minutes, and I've seen them last an hour and a half. Okay. There isn't a set time frame. It depends on what you need to discuss on this given month. Because, like I said, this month, our meeting could just be 20 minutes because oh, there really isn't a whole lot that's been brought up that's new. And then all of a sudden, next month, we've got, unfortunately, a laundry list of things that we need to discuss. So we're going to take a little bit more time. Right. So that can be fluid as well, right? Yep. Right. So don't do not do it to a time just because you're setting a time, but um, do it to a standard and to the task necessity versus time. So you may need to be fluid. But if you set them generally for, you know, an hour, typically yep. that's just a, a, a recommendation. That's more than enough usually to accomplish what you need to, right? Yes. Yeah. And after you do a few of them, you're going to get a good idea of what that time frame is for you. But to Tim's point, that hour, start with that hour time frame and work from there as your base. Yeah, yeah, great point. So another thing we want to inject is as far as what to do when you're having these meetings and we're going around and you're going to get people that agree, people that disagree. You want to avoid one of the pitfalls of having the uh, argumentative sessions during the safety committee, I guess is a good way to put it. Yep. I've seen some that have gotten pretty 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 heated um that's not always bad as long as it's controlled on folks sharing their ideas and everybody being able to maybe take a step back once in a while and listen it doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree on every idea right correct right so talk about the we use the ids as we do in in our workplace the what is identify what the issue is uh, whether it's uh, accidents or certain procedures or whatever, identify what it is and make sure everybody agrees, okay, this is the issue we're discussing right now. Now we're going to get into discussion mode. We're discussing uh, what are some potential things we can do or look at as far as getting into S, which is the solution. Take those piece by piece. Let everybody have a voice. Some people may not always have a voice, but avoid getting into, you know, pushback on everything. You have to have drivers of it, but you have to have folks that are all, uh, always willing to, to listen a little bit and take in all the suggestions. And I think that's really important when it comes to IDS. It's huge. Yeah. So uh, getting into the record keeping, uh, folks, especially in Minnesota, understand that this is. Uh, an OSHA inspectable document, the, the record keeping meeting notes, again, digital and or hard copy, as long as you can produce them. So going back to that agenda slide a few slides ago, if you have something as simple as here's my agenda, here's the date it was, it was held, call to order, here's things we discussed in that one through seven points, and you can add things in between, you'll, you'll, typically find out that the things in between get a little longer with new business and old business to come to an end state and a solution. But if you can provide something that simplistic, OSHA will take that and say, good, great. That is, that's all you need. All right. Me meeting minutes should be distributed to committee members in a uniform format. Don't have all kinds of different things lopped into one pile. So people may take their notes, like you have a notepad here today or write on the agenda but then they should all be uh, collected and put into the one format that everybody utilizes. And meeting minutes then should be posted for all employees to review. Here's the last big part. And one area where I see people come up short a bit. Why is it important for them to post it so all employees can see those meeting minutes? Well, it's very important so that they can see them because you want them to be informed. Knowledge is key to success. 
Knowledge is key to safety. And if we're letting everybody know what we discussed in the meeting and how we're going to move things, how we're going to IDS them, that's going to be huge for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the activities and some recommendations we're going to have here on the safety committee. Incident accident investigations. This should always be included as a section or a part in your safety committee meetings. Everybody involved in that safety committee should be hearing about accidents, incidents that have happened because it's very important to help identify the root cause and then develop what's going to be done to prevent it from happening again. Uh, if you get down a little bit further here, the, the bullet three, I, uh, we have on here, Bob, near misses and non-employee injuries. What is the importance of trying to record and discuss near misses? It's huge. The importance is that way, if we see a trend happening, we can share it with everybody is, hey, pay attention to this because this is what happened over on this job and something very similar on another job. And so we got two things that we don't typically see, but they're similar. So pay attention, everyone, because it could happen where you're at. Yeah. So in, in, in having the ability to collect near misses, right, before it becomes an actual accident where somebody's hurt or uh, something was damaged or anything like that, um, it, it, those are big leading indicators, right? Yes. Huge. If we can collect that information, we see there's a pattern here, whether it's a couple or it ends up being a handful of incidents is in that same realm of a certain work area or con uh, uh, consistency of the same thing happening. This is the goal, going back to proactive versus reactive. Great format and great group to discuss this in to implement solutions and control measures, whether it's a retrain, whether it is uh, applying new uh, workplace safety measures, it's um, uh, adaptation of new safety measures into your program in a specific area, and then communicating that uh, to everyone. It, near misses are important. We try to push that, folks. They are hard to get a good recording process, but I've seen some where they have a great process where folks can just fill out a very simple form. This is what happened. And then in your committee, you can discuss without going too far down the rabbit hole, what could have happened, right? That's what safety guys love to do is we talk about what could happen. But in your committee, you can come up with some things to avoid what has been happening before it becomes a bigger issue or before somebody gets hurt, right? Right, so the safety audits. Uh, we want to bring up a recommendation we impart on all of our clients um, in, in, in many instances, particularly those that have safety committees and we're a part of as a member or a non-member, but having an internal safety audit or inspection process where you have folks internally, don't wait for uh, obviously OSHA to be the one to do an in inspection or investigation. Don't even wait for OECS to come on our scheduled visits where we have scheduled audits and we give that feedback. And this is a great place to bring up our audits, which many of our clients do. They show pictures and show recommendations, but internally have an audit process with a checklist and areas where regularly you have folks taking a look at uh, specific hazards, housekeeping issues, uh, whatever it may be, and you can bring those back so you guys can, you can define internally, how are we going to communicate this to where we want to see some improvement? and get those certain groups, areas, cells, um, you know, uh, construction uh, folks out on different job sites to pay particular attention to those things we're discussing. Now, here's a little example of, of kind of what we're talking about with audit findings. This is a, a very simple uh, kind of spreadsheet or approach. We have a handful of different types of, of um, reporting formats. This is just to give you a, a, a 10,000 foot view looking down. Here's some things to maybe add and why some of these are important. Obviously the date that it was brought up, the committee member or members that brought it to the table or, or somebody that they're representing, the location where it happened, department, but then getting into those last few columns, folks. The description of what happened, responsibility, 
what methods of, of correction are we going to do? And that may take some IDSing, getting into solutions. Then that last column, date resolved. Bob, have you ever been or attended safety committees where their old business list keeps, keeps getting longer, longer and longer and longer? Oh, and yeah. now you've been to a handful and there's still no resolution on some of those dating months, sometimes years back? Oh, yeah. Been there, seen that, done yeah. that. I have too, and that's where uh, assignment of who's responsible is very important. It keeps your committee members engaged. It keeps them tasked to do some of these things. We don't want it to be just an assignment to show up to a meeting every once in a while. Correct. There's actual work to do here, and that work is going to uh, uh, grow into results, right? It's going to grow into improvement for safety and health for everybody working at the job site or working in the facility or working on a, a mine site, whatever it may be. And then enhance the communication. Communication, communication, communication. I can't stress it enough because again, we've given a couple examples where these meetings are held, minutes are taken, all of the you know stuff as far as black and white doing a good job, but then nothing is disseminated. Nothing is communicated. Publishing the, the minutes are really important. Sending out emails, posting stuff on your safety board, launching campaigns, and then it says initiatives. But I want to be, I want to, I want to just pause here for a second and talk a little bit about initiatives. Initiatives are great, but you have to avoid some of the pitfalls with initiatives, right? Oh yeah. Um, have you seen any examples of different initiatives that companies will do and implement through a safety committee? I have. I've seen, it, there's a number of them that I've seen. One that I've seen that is really good, your example of housekeeping, right? When you do an internal audit and you're seeing that you've got an issue out with housekeeping. An initiative is, let's start seeing an improvement. And once we start seeing an improvement, here's a gas card, here's a candy bar, here's something, a hat or clothing to an that initiative to help get things better. That's a really good initiative. Pitfalls to initiatives, which I know we're gonna talk about pitfalls, but is initiative on, on having really good safety reports. Now people aren't reporting anything and everything's looking really pretty all the time. <laughs> okay, now we know we've got a problem because we know for sure that it isn't always good all the time. So it's hard to be perfect. So it's hard to be perfect. Yeah, yeah, it and is. Humble in every way. And you want to avoid folks not reporting something so we don't miss out on our initiative bonus or pizza day or something like that. Not right. to say that they would, but we have witnessed that, right? Yep. Um, and then advocates for safety, folks, safety champions. Of course, we want those on the safety committee. We want the liaisons between the committee and, and the folks doing the work, and we want those folks to be recognized. Recognition uh, through positive contribution, tying into initiatives, tying into uh, the champions for safety, those are all really important. Positive recognition is important. It's, sometimes it's hard for us to do. So we're gonna talk about those pitfalls and, and hopefully some solutions here. Big one that's right out on the top canceled meetings you ever seen safety committee meeting get canceled i've seen them canceled and i've even canceled one or two in my day <laughs> yeah but it, as it says set them up in advance same day of the month same time so that you're consistent everybody gets familiar with it and then you really push to make that happen important yeah they're 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 much easier to cancel than they are to, to continue to stay on. Oh, schedule, they're right? easy to cancel. Boom, done, yeah. gone. Work hard to avoid that. That's a common one we see. And now instead of our regularly scheduled quarterly, every other month, monthly meeting, it's been all of a sudden, it's been five months since we've had a meeting, right? We're missing opportunity here. Unable to affect change. Why would it be unable to affect change? And we've seen these committees, okay? Uh, because folks you're not you don't have folks on, on your committee that are really engaged and involved correct and, and, and that may even be the leadership management level right it might be yeah yeah and and uh if you notice those discuss it within your committee okay because 
it's not about calling somebody out. It's about making sure we have the right people that are going to help affect change, positive change, positive growth, and keep folks safe and healthy. That's the end state. Lack of follow through. Again, work hard to establish assignments. Going back to one of those uh, uh, charts or those checklists we showed you earlier, spreadsheet. If you can establish assignments, now I have one or a couple folks accountable. That's who I'm going to to discuss. Why haven't we made any progress on this in seven months, Bob? Uh, you were the one that was assigned to do this or do this follow up. And instead of just spinning our wheels in the committee, you and I can have a discussion and figure out what that solution needs to be, right? Yep. Yeah. So now we can bring it to the committee. Bring it to the committee. Bingo. Yeah. No set agenda. Again, we gave a couple examples of that. You know, folks show up with blank pieces of paper, no agenda, no agendas passed out. Uh, folks show up with nothing, not even a pen to write with. There's, we're, we're missing, there's a little bit of failure there in, in the, the, that planning uh, stage of the expectations of what the charter or the bylaws are stating, the expectations of all committee members establish that you'll be able to avoid some of these simple pitfalls where people are just collected around a, a table and meeting with no outcome and veering off topic. Have you ever so seen no that solution happen? really leads to veering off topic, doesn't it? Because how's fishing? It's been really good actually this year. <laughs> good example. Yeah. Right? Yeah. People will start to talk about all kinds of things or your speaking. And then now off in the corner, I have yet you and I are talking about something or what time does this meeting end? <laughs> um, keep folks engaged. Let's stay all at the same table together. Untrained committee members. Again, uh, a, a little bit of a difficulty to avoid if you don't have the right structure and then you're, you're not balanced on when you have new members coming in versus old members going out. Try to get it to where they're offset. You have certain amount of members that stay on and then we're, we're uh, moving some out and then you always have old members, new members, and then that baton continues to get handed off, right? Yep. Yeah, because yep. if you have untrained folks, you're, you're spending time in those early on meetings to get folks up to speed of what really is the purpose and the scope of these meetings, all right? So folks, in summary, we, we want to make sure we're choosing the right folks to be on the committee, folks that want and deserve to be there. Try to avoid the voluntold um, committee members. Conduct those regularly scheduled meetings with an established agenda and communicate any changes to everyone. Ensure all actionable items are followed through to completion. You're spending the time getting together and discussing stuff that should mean something. And if you don't come through with uh, a resolution, solutions to uh, give to everybody else, folks may have heard about the safety committee, but it doesn't really hold a big value to them, right? Yep. Uh, and make communication with both employees and among committee members a priority. Again, I've said it a couple of times now, communication, 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 it is so vitally important. Never forget the ultimate goal, winding back in or, or coming back full circle to what we talked about in the very beginning. Safety and healthy employees come from a safety and healthy work environment. And the main objective is, so everybody goes home at the end of every work day. That, that is what we're talking about. Folks, we, we do want to ask you, lastly, we want to thank you for listening to us talk about uh, uh, safety committee and things that hopefully give you some value and some things to bring back to your committees or if you're establishing a new committee. Uh, let us know how we did today. One being, you know, we, we didn't do so hot. Maybe Bob and I need to practice more up to, uh, you know, you thought that it was helpful information. It was great information. Um, you know, we, we like to see how we're doing because, uh, just like everybody else, we have areas to improve too. And we want to make sure when you guys take the time to join us on these webinars, we are giving you uh, good information to take out of here. Uh, if nobody has any questions, we can open it up to some questions here for, for just a couple minutes. We're about four minutes away from, from wrapping up. Uh, just wanted to share our direct uh, uh, information here, how you can contact us, OECS, the main um, line is, uh, the main number is on top there, Bob's uh, cell, my cell, 
our uh, emails, and then the OECScomply.com. You can always uh, send a message there if you have questions, if you're looking for additional information. But again, just time to take our uh, capture our contact information. Justine, did you have any other burning questions out there before we wrap up? The only one that a uh, few asked for are slides for this. Yeah, so uh, slides, the, this presentation will be made available on our website. Like I said, uh, usually need about a day to post it on there. So it should be ready by tomorrow. Uh, I'm not really the, Bob and I aren't really the, uh, the tech guys. Um, but we will we we will turn this in and, and make sure it's available. And if you don't see it, by all means, again, going back to our contact information, get a hold of us or just email or or get on the website and ask for a copy of it. We're more than happy to to provide that to you. Other than that, they're just all thanking you guys. Great information. A lot of threes, twos, really great. They're all. You're, awesome. Good job, guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Justine, for helping us out today. Thanks again to all of you for being a part of the webinar today. Uh, take care and be safe. You guys want to stay on after? <laughs>